All right. Well, I'm going to make this short and sweet because I know we're all e eagerly waiting to hear these witnesses to history speak. Um, just a note that we will have a Q&A session at the end, and if anyone has questions for Joel Goldstein, he is going to be here and available as well. Um, so, President Ford once referred to photographers as the people you can trust. Joining us this evening on stage and via Zoom are David Hume Kennerly, presidential photographer of Gerald R. Ford, who also documented for Time Magazine the vice presidential transition of Spiro Agnew and Ford. Thank you. <laughs> and then we've got um, Bob McNeely, presidential photographer of Bill Clinton and vice presidential photographer of Walter Mondale. And then we also have David Valdez, presidential and vice presidential photographer of George H.W. Bush. And joining us via Zoom is Lawrence Jackson, presidential photographer of Barack Obama and current vice presidential photographer of Kamala Harris. Welcome, Lawrence. Who just got back from Indonesia. Just got back from Indonesia. He's a little jet lagged, maybe. You look like you just got back from Indonesia. It hurts. <laughs> So please join me in welcoming these gentlemen to the Ford Museum. As the senior member of this crew, right? <laughs> Although McNeely's close, I'll say that, he's close. But in terms of uh, presidential evolution, um, I'm also on the board here, the, the Gerald Ford Foundation. They needed one photographer, and I was it. So, uh, um, yeah, they needed somebody who wasn't a Secretary of State or a former Defense Secretary um, with peculiar attitude of the job. Uh, I'll show you. So I met President Ford. I'll show you how that happened. Uh, I wasn't the photographer for him in the government, but in fact, I was working for Time Magazine. And um, so why don't we just show the pictures, and I'll, I'll just say next, right? Is that it? Well, the technology is a little lagging here at the Ford. It's, uh, so Spiro Agnew, actually, I, I wanted to get a bumper sticker that said Spiro Agnew got me my job at the White House. Um, <laughs> but, he resigned, this is the day after he resigned, and of course, in Washington, if you die or quit or whatever, it's not like, oh, too bad. It's like, who's gonna replace him, I, I swear. And uh, that was what we went through at the time, and it was up to me to take a, pictures of a couple of contenders. Uh, Joel mentioned um, uh, John Conley was probably uh, Nixon's favorite. They were very much alike, personally, I think. But Ford was the guy who could get confirmed. But when I went up to, and met with him, uh, and he was very nice, uh, he said, you're wasting your time. Show the next one. This is him in his office up at uh, the Hill. He was minority leader of the House. And I took some portraits of him. This is on a Thursday, I think. He had not been contacted by the White House. I mean, this is, in today's age, it's almost impossible to imagine this. And um, so, very accommodating, took the pictures, and then the next day, Nixon calls him, offers him a job, show the next picture. Uh, the portrait I did of him was on the cover of Time. It was his first cover, mine. So this is 50 years ago, uh, October, 10th, right? That's when Agnew resigned. But the, the date on this is October 22nd, which would have been a week later. Uh, go to the next one. And I just found this picture. I, I love this picture. You're seeing it for the first time in, in my voluminous archive. But uh, this has nothing to do with it. But it's him as vice president. Go ahead. And being sworn in uh, with Nixon over on the right. Uh, James Eastland, Carl Albert, Speaker of the House. Uh, and next one, Nixon and Ford up that evening. So this officially makes him the Vice President. He did, uh, <clears throat> I didn't put it in there, uh, had to undergo House hearings uh, to get the job. Next one. 
<coughs> excuse me, um, the Fords at home in Alexandria, Virginia. I think I shot this for People magazine. Go ahead. Uh, this is crazy, right? <coughs> A costume party, and Mrs. Ford just loved doing stuff like this. And, and I, I got to hand it to the VP. I mean, he, he went along with it. Go ahead. Now, this picture is because of the socks. Could you see those socks? <laughs> this is in the living room uh, over on Crown Drive in uh, uh, Alexandria. But I, I think I was so disturbed by the socks. I'd see the next frame. I somehow maneuvered this fruit bowl. <laughs> These things don't happen by accident. Uh, neither one of them got used. But anyway, go ahead. Uh, this is at Mount, the Mauna Kea Hotel in Hawaii. And Ford was in incredibly good shape. He swam every day. Could have been one of the most athletic presidents ever. Got a bum rap on. Uh, 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 falling down and all that, but he had bad knees, which was part of the problem. Go ahead. You mentioned Bob Dole, Joel. Uh, this is campaigning for Dole in 1974, uh, when Dole was running for uh, Senate, and President Ford um, was, the, I mean, VP Ford. I don't know who the guy on the left is, so. Does anybody know him? I've, he's like lost to history. All right, next. <laughs> on, the, on the south lawn of the White House, you've got Ford, Nixon, and uh, a young George Bush over on the left, who was uh, at that time the head of the Republican National Committee. Other people in here? I don't know. I can't tell. Annette, go ahead. This is the pardon me, Jerry, picture. Uh, <laughs> Uh, today, by the way, is the 49th anniversary of the pardon of Richard Nixon. I'm going to show you a, a few of those. But I don't think the relationship was that close. But here are two men who were Navy veterans of World War II. Look at the, the, the cast of characters. You have George Bush uh, was a Navy pilot hero. And these two guys were in World War II. It was just a, uh, the greatest generation. And um, uh, I think it was a bit of an uneasy relationship. But go ahead to the next frame. I threw all this in there. On the left is Hillary Rodham, before she was Hillary Clinton. And this is the committee that's impeaching uh, President Ford. This also leads to me becoming a White House employee. Uh, Peter Rodino on the right. But I love people smoking cigarettes. And Hillary's wearing uh, uh, glasses. I've never shown this photo before. I just found it the other day. Go ahead. And two days before Nixon resigns, this is in the cabinet room. And uh, it was a, a routine cabinet uh, meeting. But And I, I'm surprised to this day that they allowed us to photograph in there. We were only there at the top. But I managed to get around to the so behind Vice President Ford. And uh, the, other, the next picture that I don't have is uh, with me is the empty chair in Ford City where Nixon was uh, like three days later. Go ahead. And the, the showing the strain of Watergate on Richard Nixon. This is in the Oval Office. Go ahead. And I'm going to play this tape because it's important to what happened to me as a, getting the job. This is Richard Nixon, um, uh, August 8th, the day before he officially resigned going on national TV and saying he's resigning. But he's talking to his White House photographer and uh, who had been with him for his whole presidency, Ollie Atkins, and uh, been on the campaign with him. Uh, and this is the conversation. Oops, maybe it's not. In this room during this. Only the crew. No, there, no, there will be no picture. No, after the broadcast. You've taken your picture, didn't, didn't you take one just now? That's it. Uh, because, you know, we don't want it. We, we didn't let the, the press is going to take one, so you've taken it. And you Just take it right now. This is right after the broadcast. You got it? Come on. <laughs> God. I've seen this like a hundred times. I still can't get over it. But the point of that was... 
the next day, President Ford, uh, well, he became president at noon. Well, let's continue, sorry. We'll go no, next, there we go. So these are pictures I took of uh, the next day as Nixon leaves uh, after resigning August 9th, 1974. Next year, as you know, will be the 50th anniversary. Go ahead. And the contact sheet where you can see from the left <clears throat> uh, Nixon uh, getting up on the helicopter. The whole sequence, uh, I, I timed it from a film, uh, was about like 12 or 14 seconds. I was shooting with a motor drive. Go ahead. And this photograph, I, there was another one, which you'll see the next one, where he's like waving uh, with his lips pierced. But this is the, if, if I were Nixon, in the picture, I'd be looking up the White House. This is on the south lawn of the White House. And that particular moment is just, uh, it was quick, but it's like him looking at the White House for the last time as president. Go ahead. And I always thought this was the better one. It's a good one. But uh, the other one's a little more interesting. Go ahead. Go ahead. And then the, the staff starts applauding him, the people who came out to the South Lawn. And this is why he went into like campaign mode, but it wasn't a, a fun time. It was one of the dark moments of presidential history. Go ahead. And the Fords wa uh, waving goodbye to him. You can't see him, but he's in, in, in the helicopter. Go ahead. And then they walk away on the left. All right. And this is the cover of my book, which is no longer available here. Sorry, we're thinking about trying to get it reprinted. Uh, next one. And Ford being sworn in. Uh, this is about an, less than an hour after Nixon leaves. Uh, and that night, as I was saying, I was over at the Ford's house in Alexandria, and he offered me the job as his uh, chief White House photographer. And I didn't want to be like Ollie Atkins, like not having access, having some secretary saying you can't go in there. I mean, the, the, uh, the Richard Nixon photo library is like a, a, a desert. I mean, it's missing some of the great moments, like uh, withdrawing from Vietnam and all that. And I, I wasn't going to do that. I, I won a Pulitzer Prize in Vietnam. I was, uh, uh, I liked being where the action was, not sitting in a chair outside the door. So the president that night asked me to be his White House photographer. And I looked him in the eye, I was 27 years old, and I said, uh, I would do it if I have total access and report directly to you. And he stopped smoking his pipe. And I thought, OK, I'm going to call my parents and tell them my president offered me this really good job. And I told him to shove it. And, uh, <laughs> He started laughing and he said, you don't want Air Force One on the weekends? <laughs> so we made a deal. <laughs> Go ahead. And uh, right off the bat, I'm in the Oval Office and you can see the empty uh, shelves. All the Nixon stuff's been taken off. All this transition just happened overnight. Next one. And this is signing the pardon of uh, Richard Nixon. September 8th, 49 years ago, it was a Sunday morning, go ahead. And afterwards, he went down the hallway, and this is Bill Timmons' office, who worked as a counselor to him, and you can see Nixon's portrait is still up there, and Ford's vice presidential photo on the wall. And he got holy help from people calling him, uh, uh, but a lot of them called and said, I think you did the right thing, but I'm gonna have to blast you for it, go ahead. And then one of my favorite moments in the president's uh, uh, history was testifying on the pardon in front of the House. He's the only president since Abraham Lincoln, uh, before or since, to testify to Congress. And he went up there sitting by himself at the table explaining why he pardoned Richard Nixon. And uh, I truly believe uh, the act of pardoning Nixon cost him the presidency because of his as I pointed out, his poll numbers went down. And uh, even so, it was one of the closest races in history. Go ahead. And uh, I'll end with this picture. This is the Gerald Ford I knew. This is him as vice president. And um, uh, really one of the most wonderful people I ever worked with and gave me an extraordinary opportunity 
to, to document uh, a vice presidency, but mainly his presidency, which uh, didn't last long enough. All right, I'm going to turn it over to is it David next? Yeah. Valdez. David Valdez, old friend, uh, worked for George Herbert Walker Bush for eight years and then uh, became the president's photographer. So go, go ahead there. Thank you, David. It's great to always hear your stories. Uh, so my story, um, uh, I wound up going to work for Vice President Bush in 1983, I, I was the uh, chief photographer for Nation's Business Magazine, which at the time was the largest selling business magazine in the country. And, and uh, I was on an assignment to photograph Vice President, or Barbara Bush, Vice President's wife. And um, uh, Scott Applewhite from the Associated Press told me that the Vice President's photographer had quit and had gone on to Time Magazine. And that was kind of my career goal. So I said, well, gee, I'll send a letter to the vice president's office. I wrote a cold letter to Shirley Green, who was the vice president's press secretary. Fortunately, she was from Texas. I'm from Texas. And um, uh, she called me in. I interviewed. And um, uh, then I had an interview with Admiral Murphy, who was the uh, uh, chief of staff at the time. Then I went in to interview with um, uh, Vice President Bush. And it never really occurred to me that David Valdez from Alice, Texas, was going to be meeting one-on-one -on -one with the Vice President of the United States. But I, I went in, and he's showing me around the Vice President's office and telling me, well, you're going to be with me in public and private. And we have to have this trust relationship. And I'm thinking to myself, no one's offered me the job. Uh, and I don't know what the salary is. And I, and I said, well, do you know what the salary is? And he says, you know, I have no idea. Why don't we call up? Dan Murphy, Admiral Murphy, and, and ask him. And this is in the old executive office building, and the walls are old and thin. And I could hear Admiral Murphy screaming through the walls, saying, what? He's, a, he's asking you about salary? Well, they hired me anyway. <laughs> so, so we went down to um, Florida. And, and uh, you know, I had to get hired and go through clearance and stuff. And, and uh, uh, the vice president went down to Florida. And um, uh, I flew down commercially. And that was the last time in decades that I flew commercially. And, and I was shocked when I had to fly commercially again. I guess it was, it was, and you had to carry your own bags and you know, who are all these people. But um, so I, 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 they fly me out to this island uh, down on, on South Florida uh, where he was at. And, and they flew me out in a helicopter. And, and I, I land, and the vice president comes out to greet me. And he says, well, come on in. You need to meet uh, Barbara Bush. And we had breakfast that first morning. So I'd literally been on the job a couple hours. And, and um, uh, he said, look, we're, we're going up to Miami. Um, we have these cigarette ra race boats, and we're going to drive them up. And he told me, look, you have this helicopter here. Why don't you get back in the helicopter and take photos of us t driving the boats? And, and I started my photography career in the Air Force, so I was used to flying around in helicopters. And so it was, OK, let's do that. So we get up to Miami, and, and uh, we get to the hotel room. And there's um, Jeb Bush, his son. And Jeb and Columba uh, just had a baby, uh, Jeb Jr. And, and Jeb was bringing uh, Jebby around uh, to meet his grandfather for the first time. and, and um, there were a lot of staff people in, in this hotel suite and Secret Service. And, and, and I noticed that when Jeb came and he, and he asked his dad to babysit while he went and did a meeting. And, and uh, uh, I got to think to myself, well, nobody's telling me what to do. And, and I got to thinking about the history of, of uh, White House photographers and Yoshi Okamoto and David, uh, people who had preceded me. and, and the access that they had, and I'd heard David talk about, you know, total access, and I never actually had access to personally using Air Force One on the weekends, but 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 um, um, so I went into the uh, hotel suite and took some photos of uh, uh, Gampy and Jebby for the first time, and and uh, of course I was shooting film at the time. The White House Communications Agency would process the film and make prints, and then a few days later I sent some prints over and. 
got a note from Barbara Bush uh, saying, I love the pictures you took of Gampy and Jebby. As long as you take pictures of my grandchildren, you can go anywhere and do whatever you want to do. So that was my ticket, and, and I <laughs> had total access. So I just brought some random photos, so we'll just go through and see what we got. So th this was, this is kind of funny. This is when he was the first time he was elected president. I was just a private citizen standing on the side of the road, and this guy comes by, and I take a picture, and, and that photo actually wound up hanging in my office in the White House uh, for four years. Next slide. And of course, Vice President Bush, uh, I guess it was Walter Mondale, uh, selected uh, Ger Geraldine Ferraro to be his vice presidential can candidate, and, uh, and they lost, and, and Vice President Bush invited her over. Uh, he was very gracious uh, with any people, that, anybody that he met. Uh, uh, it, was, it was one of the things that I really admired about him. Uh, you know, President Ford uh, selected him to be um, our ambassador, to, or our liaison, the People's Republic of China, and he was uh, the director of the Central Intelligence Agency. And he met people from around the world. And, and uh, one time, actually, when he was president, we go to the UN, and we're walking down the hall with this mob of people. And he sees this guy standing over up against the wall. And it was the janitor who had been there when he was uh, the ambassador to uh, uh, the United Nations. And he went over and greeted the guy, called him by his name, and everybody was shocked because we were with all these world leaders. And it was like, well, what's the president of the United States doing talking to this guy over here? But he was just, that was the kind of guy he was. And, and it was kind of fun after he was liaison uh, to the People's Republic of China, um, uh, and then wound up becoming president of the United States. We went to China, and, and this embassy staff, they had a private dinner for everybody. So it's kind of cool. Next, next slide. And of course, Michael Dukakis um, ran and, and, and lost. And it was kind of interesting. Um, it, you know, all the characters uh, in, that get together in history. And, and during this race, uh, uh, Joe Biden was uh, uh, running for president. And, and I think he wound up plagiarizing somebody's remarks and, and wound up dropping out of the race. And, and uh, but you know, he went on become president of the United States, so you, know, you know, never know. But uh, this was another one of those moments. Um, I have a great photo of me with the uh, two people there uh, taken by Barbara Bush that I'm real. Uh, it's kind of fun to have. Next slide, please. And President Nixon at the vice president's house. And um, uh, we've all been in this house. And the bookshelves are all uh, uh, books about uh, uh, vice presidents. And, and I noticed um, uh, when Dick Cheney was vice president, I was in the vice president's house, and they didn't have my book. Uh, and so I, I wound up getting one packaged up, and actually they're available in the bookstore. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but um, uh, so my book got in there when, when uh, Dick Cheney was vice president. Next slide. And of course, there he is with President Nixon and Supreme Court Justice. Next slide. So Vice President Bush uh, you know, was our liaison to the uh, 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 People's Republic of China. He was the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, um, uh, Vice President of the United States. And through all of this, uh, he was very strong in foreign policy as a vice president. And I think uh, Ronald Reagan, as president, leaned on him uh, to help with foreign policy. And, so we traveled to communist Poland and met with shipyard worker Lech Walesa. And um, uh, it was a very clandestine meeting. Actually, the, uh, usually when you travel with the president or vice president, the, the White House staff advanced people set this up. But, but this, in this case, it was the CIA who kind of coordinated this uh, meeting. Um, um, and uh, uh, we went to Lech Walesa's house. And Lech Walesa said, someday Poland will be free, and someday you, George Bush, will be president of the United States. And, and we wound up going back with President Bush, meeting with President Lech Walesa. And it was, it was just an incredible thing that, that happened in a, uh, to experience a, a little slice of history like that. And, and um, uh, as an example, 
uh, when, when the Berlin Wall uh, came down, uh, the political people told, uh, this is President Bush story, but the political people told President Bush, well, you need to go to Berlin, stand on the wall and wave the flag and say, we won the Cold War. And he said, you, you know, it's not our victory, it's their victory. And, um, uh, and, and he said in, this in the Oval Office, if, if, um, if I go there, some rogue Russian general will probably launch mi missiles. 30 years later, I'm in Georgetown, Texas, where I live, and, and I went to, a, um, to hear a, a, a Ukrainian missionary speak, and he was in the uh, Soviet army, and he was there when the Berlin Wall came down and communism fell, and, and he was saying, had, he's speaking, and I'm in the audience, and this gentleman speaking, and, and says, um, had George Bush, Pre President Bush, gone to Berlin, we probably would have launched missiles. And I'm so proud of President Bush for uh, uh, restraining himself and not going. And I'm so proud of President Bush that I've carried a photo of him in my wallet all these years. And the guy pulls out a photo, and it's my photo. And, and uh, so I had to raise my hand in, in front of all these people and, and say, have I got a story for you? <laughs> and so and ne next photo, please. Um, so. President Reagan and, and Vice President Bush every Thursday had had a lunch, and and it was it was a time where they could just really talk about things. Um, but the, the first Thursday that George Bush was president, he called President Reagan at lunchtime and said, "Well, I, I'm getting ready to have lunch, and I'm, I, I miss having my." Uh, weekly lunch with you and, and you know, typical George Herbert Walker Bush uh, reaching out to somebody and, and President Reagan was uh, so appreciative of, of being remembered that way. Next slide, please. And of course, the cowboy boots, that's Air Force Two and uh, uh, we had a lot of fun, you know, when, when uh, he was uh, the youngest, one of the, well, we used to say the youngest Navy fighter pilot in World War II, and, and we found uh, another guy in Texas who was actually a couple of months younger. So since then, we've had to say one of the na youngest Navy fight fighter pilots in World War II, and those two got together one time, and, and that was kind of neat. I wound up meeting the guy's daughter. Uh, but, um, uh, uh, well, next slide. So this photo um, wound up on the cover of Newsweek magazine, and uh, um, Vice President Bush was uh, on his way up to Kenny Bunkport, and he read in the Washington Post style section uh, that one of the reporters from Newsweek was going up to Kenny Bunkport and was going to a wedding. And so he called her up and, and said, uh, well, would you like a ride? And uh, so she joined us. On, on Air Force Two, and we go up to Kenny Bunkport, and he invites her into the house, and uh, they have lunch, and, and she's asking questions of, of the different people that are around there. And uh, she wound up um, uh, writing a story about George Bush uh, just, just before the campaign, and, and uh, the headline, this is the cover of Newsweek, and, and over there in the blue, it's George Bush fighting the wimp factor. And, and uh, he was really upset by that. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of people really were, because w when you think back on his career and the things that he had done and, and uh, you know, being shot down in World War II and, and surviving and never really wanted to talk about that politically because he didn't want to take advantage of, of the families who had lost their family members in war. And, and, uh, um, but uh, it was the first, one of the first times that a, a photo on the cover of a national news magazine in the United States was also on the cover of the Asian version uh, uh, and, and with the same r r title, but it was in Japanese. So I actually had President Bush sign the copy in the Japanese version because I didn't want to have to go and say, oh, by the way, look at my photo and you're fighting the wimp vector. Next. And then um, uh, President Bush and Kenny Bunkport, I think he was being interviewed, 
um, by David Frost uh, during, during this. And this wound up becoming the cover of my book, which I think I mentioned is available in the bookstore. <laughs> Next slide, please. And his dog, Ranger. Uh, so, so President Reagan is president for eight years, and he has these little King Charles Spaniels, and they're running around. And President Reagan used to step out of the Oval Office into the Rose Garden and feed the squirrels. And then George Bush becomes president, and, and uh, he has Springer Spaniels. And, and uh, you should have seen the blood in the Oval Office. It was horrible. Uh, next shot, please. So you, you know, uh, George Bush was captain of the Yale baseball team. And we go to Denver, and um, uh, they, they were having a, a baseball game with a lot of the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame players. And uh, uh, George Bush said, oh, I'd, I'd love to go. And, and, and so he goes. And this was kind of spontaneous. And he goes into the locker room, and he suits up. And, and they say, well, ladies and gentlemen, we have a surprise baseball player. And he comes out, and it's the vice president of the United States. Well, he, he gets up to bat, and he actually gets a hit. And it goes out into the uh, uh, right field, and, and he gets on base. And then they eventually get thrown out at second base. but but. Uh, then he comes back out when they switch sides, and he plays first base, which is where he played. And, and they wound up uh, getting two outs. And then uh, on the third out, they hit a short ball, and, and they throw it over to first base. And, and he wounds up catching it and getting the guy out at first base. So he went off uh, you know, with full crowd and cheering. It was really a lot of fun. Well, what was interesting is, is when he was a little boy, um, and they would play baseball, and he'd come home, um, uh, and they would say, oh, we won the baseball game. We won the baseball game. And, and um, um, his mother would say, well, did you congratulate the other team for a game well played? And I think that came into play when, when the Berlin Wall came down. And he's like, no, it's, it's not our victory. It's their victory. And, and that was just his character. He, he was. The most important things to him were his family, his faith, and his friends. And I got a couple of photos of family. Let's see what we got up next. David Kennerly um, set this photo up for himself. And I shot over his shoulder and, and, and <laughs> captured this moment. And I, I thought, in, in honor of David, I would show his photo uh, that, that I took. OK, next. And then the uh, three ladies who were wives of the vice president. So it's Marilyn Quayle, Barbara Bush, and Tipper Gore. Next, please. That's me. And we just had a lot of fun going out boating. So the very first time I go to Kenny Bunkport with the vice president, and he's walking me around their grounds um, at Walker's Point, uh, we get down to the boat dock. And, and he says, you know, as a little boy, I used to go swimming here. And he said, you, you and I ought to do this. And, and uh, you know, I, I'm kind of dressed like this and have my camera gear, and that's the Atlantic Ocean. And I'm from South Texas. And it's like, ah, it's not happening. And he said, no, and I, it, it's fine. Let's, I have a couple of swimsuits up at the house. So we go up to the house. We go into the bedroom. We both strip down. We put on the swimsuits. We walk back out. He says, on the count of three, we'll jump. One, two, three, I jumped. And he walked back to the house. <laughs> Next shot. And you can see how much taller he was than me. That's, I think Susan Biddle took that photo. Next. So this photo um, uh, was just before he was going to run for president. And, and um, uh, Life magazine, uh, the photo editor, Bobby Baker Burroughs, wanted to send a Life magazine photographer up to Kenny Bunkport and take some photos. And he, and he said, no, I'm on vacation. And, um, uh, so we talked back and forth a little bit, and Bobby said, OK, well, I don't know David Valdez, but uh, we'll, we'll give him a shot and see what he gets. So I went to Barbara Bush, who, who is the enforcer. Um, and actually, if you go to the uh, 41's library, they have a new t-shirt that says the enforcer on it with some pearls. And um, so I took this photo, and we sent it off to Bobby Baker Burroughs at Life Magazine. 
And she loved it and wound up running it two full pages in life and then in uh, uh, classic moments in life and the best of life for the past 75 years. And, and what's really interesting is I took another frame from over here across and in the background is George W. Bush. And, and it's like, well, who would have known that both of those people would have become president of the United States? Next, please. And I'm just playing basketball with, that's George W. <coughs> and Marvin and George P. George P. Uh, was the Texas Land Commissioner uh, up until just a, a year or so ago. Uh, I worked on his campaign and it was, it was kind of fun because we, we would travel all over the state of Texas and I'd photograph him and, and he'd do similar things like his grandfather would and it was kind of deja vu. Next please. And then just a couple hours before he's sworn in, so this is across the street from the White House at the Blair House and two of his uh, granddaughters. And at the top is Lauren Bush, who later in life wound up marrying the son of Ralph Lauren. So today her name is Lauren Lauren. Okay, next. And then here he is trying to take my job. He's down here taking Polaroid snaps. That's in the vice president's house. And he always wore that red jacket to Christmas time without veil. Next. And, and with the girls at the vice president's house uh, uh, on the swing, there, there's another photo that I have uh, uh, just outside the Oval Office, very similar to this situation with some of the grandchildren. That's what I was saying about faith, family, and friends. Next. And George and Barbara Bush. So in, in Georgetown, Texas, uh, there's a catfish place. And uh, uh, the, the uh, cook there took this photo and photoshopped himself into the photo. And so every time I go to the catfish place, I see my photo and it's like, at least I should get a free meal. So, and then we, we, we did talk just briefly about the transition. And I'll tell a story that I've never told before. But when George Bush was vice president, um, uh, Ronald Reagan had to go have a, a colon operation. He transferred power. So the vice president stayed at the vice president's residence. And they decided, well, it's just going to be a couple of hours. We'll play tennis. So he's playing tennis. He slips. He falls. He hits his head and is knocked out. And uh, there's the, uh, the vice president, the acting president, laying on the tennis court at the vice president's house, knocked out for just a few seconds. But boy, talk about Secret Service coming out of the woodwork. Uh, uh, to scoop him up and take him up, and, and nothing was ever uh, done about it, and I don't think it's ever been publicly really talked about. So there you go. I think that's all I have. OK. Thank uh, you, thank you. So Bob McNeely, good friend, uh, was a um, Vietnam vet by the way, and um, uh, worked with Walter Mondale and then with uh, Bill Clinton and Steve White House driver, Robert. So I'm gonna, this picture is a uh, picture should appeal to Joel. This is uh, an infamous moment in presidential politics. I have a few folks here old enough to remember this. I was a volunteer in 1972 had come home from Vietnam and got involved in the McGovern campaign as a Vietnam veteran against the war and just kept showing up at events and eventually ended up becoming part of the campaign. And Tom Eagleton who was named as his VP. And this is kind of an interesting process how these, and I was listening to Joel very carefully, how it went back to where the VP candidate had been picked by the party organizations and by people that didn't have any, you know, that sort of could look at the overview or balance the ticket. George McGovern, as far as I could find out or find out later, it had about a five minute conversation with Tom Eagleton in the White House gym at one point. And he had been very involved, obviously, up to the last minute getting the nomination for president. And when it came time to pick a VP, Whatever that process was, he ended up on picking Senator Eagleton. And then, of course, there was the 
developing story of his hospitalizations for electric shock, for having manic depression uh, several times through a campaign and things. And this was about to come out and be published. We had flown as, I was gonna photograph Senator Eagleton and had flown with him to South Dakota to do some pictures. And this was a moment when they had already had the conversation about this uh, story to be published about the uh, electric shock, but nobody else really knew it. They just had had it between themselves and, and uh, Senator McGovern's wife. And they came out, we were supposed to do pictures, and they sat there, and I was the only photographer uh, doing these for the campaign. And I kind of remember at the time, it was a, there was just a funny sense to the picture. I mean, they didn't look comfortable with each other, but you just sort of, I'm trying to direct them a little. And later, obviously this was never used for a campaign, since that campaign came apart fairly quickly. Um, and he found another vice presidential nominee, but it's a picture that I've had personally, and it's, it's just one that's it's part of my archive. It's just one of these moments, and it's like the first instant where I had actually photographed something very historical. I had wanted to photograph politics. I was enjoying politics. And at the time, I didn't think it was that big a deal. I was like, yeah, what's a little electric shock between friends? And, and, uh, but it obviously was the end of his you know, career as the vice presidential nominee. But he went on to serve as senator and is a, was a wonderful man. I mean, he was a, a very hardworking, very talented, but at that point in time, it just wasn't gonna happen. And it's interesting how Senator McGovern, I mean, his lack of preparation and, and this whole uh, event just sort of was one more uh, chink in, in his campaign that uh, obviously fell apart and didn't, didn't succeed very well. Okay, next slide. So as um, was mentioned, I became uh, the photographer for Vice President Mondale uh, in, in 76. I did some campaign photography for him. There was another photographer working with uh, President, with Governor Carter, and we had a conversation about whether or not to become a photographer to photograph uh, President Carter. And it would have been a little bit like being Ollie Atkins and trying to photograph Nixon. I mean, Jimmy Carter had sort of the same, you've got enough, that's enough, Ollie. You can leave, you know, leave the room. I'd, and um, the other photographer said to me, no, no, you want to photograph Mondale, he'll travel. This is in Israel, and um, Begin, the Israeli prime minister, and the general, I can't remember his name. Do you? Moshe Dayan. Moshe Dayan, thank you, uh, in, a, in a meeting. But, um, and Mondale was a, a wonderful guy, I mean, a very fascinating guy. And it was an interesting, for me, uh, three and a half years of uh, by myself traveling the world as David did by himself photographing the vice president as Lawrence is doing now by himself photographing the vice president. But uh, it's a, with um, Mondale it was a wonderful opportunity because Carter didn't like a lot of the diplomacy parts of the presidency, didn't like the travel, didn't like going around the world sitting in you know, overstuffed sofas and rooms with old paintings and, and funny wallpaper. And uh, Mondale did that a lot, and we traveled a lot, and it was an interesting time uh, for those. And that was my f first long-term uh, involvement in White House photography. Next, please. And this is just another picture of, of Carter and Mondale on the South Lawn. Uh, Carter's daughter Amy's in that front row and a couple of cabinet secretaries. And you can sort of see the, the distance there. Carter's coming out, uh, Mondale's sort of hanging back. There was a, it was an interesting relationship. I mean, obviously Carter had brought Mondale into the uh, White House, into the West Wing. He had his own office for the first time and was part of a lot of the meetings. Um, but there was a certain limit there and a certain sense of, uh, almost military. I mean, Carter had been a graduate of uh, Annapolis and had a, very, had a very sort of strict attitude, I think, in a way of you know, underlings and subordinates. And even though Mondale might have been the number one subordinate, he still was. And there were uh, several instances where <laughs> there were things that Mondale had wanted to do or, or had ideas for. Uh, I remember one time, he, Mondale is uh, Norwegian, and he'd always wanted to go to Scandinavia. He'd wanted that from the minute 
He became vice president. He would talked about it several times. He'd made many trips to Europe, three or four. And he'd been vice president for two or three years. And uh, I was in his office. He was up meeting with President Carter. And I heard this ruckus coming down the hall. And it's Mondale coming down the hall from talking to Carter, screaming at the top of his lungs just about, saying, he can tell if somebody wants to have a good time and it smells like shit to him. And he was so mad that he kept putting forward this trip. To, finally, he did get to go. The next year, we went to Norway. But Carter was, was I mean, as you know, I think Cousin Cheap, his cousin, uh, just died. I can't, what was his? Huh? Hugh. Hugh. Hugh sold the yacht. Uh, there were no photos on the walls in the White House. There was a whole lot of the kind of maybe a little over the top kind of things, but the things that add to morale, the kind of things that make the spirit in the White House, and that was smelled like, you know what, to Jimmy Carter. That wasn't part of his makeup. Um, next picture, please. And then this is just a picture of when Clinton was president. I just put in because it has a picture, it has President Ford and President Bush and, of course, President Carter. This is when they were all there for the um, signing of NAFTA. Uh, early in the uh, Clinton presidency, up in the uh, second floor of, of the White House in the residence. Next slide, please. So the next sequence of pictures, uh, for the six, I was fo fo the photographer in the White House for Bill Clinton for six and a half years, and Al Gore was a pretty much big part of that. There was a very close relationship there, a working relationship, and sort of a study in the vice presidency. So. I've included this in my, because I would be the photographer in there when Gore was interacting with Clinton and was, would be watching him. And then, of course, I photographed him during his campaign for presidency. Next slide, please. So this is a picture of, of, of course, Clinton, Gore, and uh, Harold Ickes. And um, one point, somebody at an event like this asked me, did you always follow them into the bathroom? <laughs> And I said, no, only if it was both the president and the vice president. It was just one of them, and they could go up by themselves. Next picture. This is kind of an, uh, the, Clinton's working on a statement here in a speech. And there was this much of a sense of working together. I mean, Clinton liked Gore's mind, the way it worked. He, you know, they had a lot in common, both being from the South, around the same age. There was, an, you know, not a lot in shared experiences. Uh, obviously, Gore came from a very well, more well-to-do background, more, you know, imbued in politics. Clinton, you know, raised himself up. But uh, next slide. But you can see, Gore was always, uh, you know, a part of the meetings. And I still, you know, remember a lot of very important meetings. This was a uh, during the uh, events in uh, Mogadishu in Somalia when the uh, troops had been ambushed and killed during an event. And that's a very top secret map, which I deliberately didn't photograph. Um, but at the end of a meeting like this, they would be the last two people in the room. And so Clinton would talk to Gore, bounce ideas, and listen to him. And, and, uh, that was, and to me, that really was an interesting relationship because that was the two guys that were going to stand for election together. They were the guys that had to. Uh, I mean, that was the important relationship. And everybody else, uh, although they were advisors, and, and it was interesting to you know, listen to them, and it was important, that was the, the main connection. Next. This is a uh, picture in actually Gore's office. The, uh, he wasn't in the same office that uh, Mondale had been in. Mondale had been uh, straight down the hall. This was, I think. Actually, no, he was in the same office. I'm, I, excuse me, I'm getting confused for a second there. But this is, of course, the Dalai Lama. But what the important thing is, if you look at Gore, what he's doing is he's, it's almost like in basketball. He's, it's like somebody you know, watching Michael Jordan and wanting to see when to make the pass or what, what's, what's he thinking. He's kind of in his, his uh, supporting role. And they would have lunches together, just like the lunches with uh, Reagan in uh, 41. And it was always interesting. I mean, Clinton would just go in and sit down to have lunch and be sitting there. 
Gore would come in with a yellow legal pad with half a dozen pages all written out with all the things he wanted to discuss at lunch. I mean, he was going to go right down his list, and I think, you know, Clinton would be there drinking his Diet Cokes, having a burger, and sort of, but not anywhere near the same kind of approach that Gore had, which is in this picture. All right, next. Then this is uh, in the blue room at the peace signing, actually, with uh, uh, Arafat. And that's Rabin, the, the prime minister who was assassinated. But this, once again, is the, you know, the two of them uh, working together. I mean, it's, and the fascinating thing was, I mean, I'll get off on it a little bit as, as we're talking later, too. Gore had eight years to watch Clinton be this consummate politician, just the way he would speak, the way he dealt with people and what he did. And yet, once he was running for the presidency on his own, he sort of reverted back to a personality. I had covered him in 1988 when he ran in that same race at Dukakis, ended up being the uh, uh, nominee. And Biden was one of the candidates that didn't. And there was a, an energy and an arrogance about Gore then that made him very hard to connect and to like, which is kind of the way he ran again in 2000 which is the antithesis of what Bill Clinton is. I mean, he's the guy that immediately makes you feel, even a, a large audience. I mean, I watched many times speaking to a large audience. He'd come up with a set of prepared remarks, start giving them, and you could tell the audience really wasn't interested in what he was saying. And you could almost follow his thought process as he started changing trying this subject or changing a little bit of the energy and how he was speaking until he had the audience listening to him and paying attention and bringing them along. And it's something that Gore and President Clinton's wife couldn't do. I mean, the two of them, when they would get up to speak, it would be what they had in front of them, like it or not, right down the line. So, Next picture. This is a, an interesting picture for a whole bunch of reasons, other than that's, at that point, Erskine Bowles was the White House Chief of Staff. This is um, in the middle of what has become known, of course, as the Lewinsky Affair. And- Oh, what was that about? Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, no, there's nobody too young here to not know that. Um, but what's fascinating, <clears throat> this is on a day that they were making an announcement about the budget deficit had gone to zero. They're getting prepared, getting briefed. They're going to walk over to the East Room in the White House. But as they're standing there, Clinton takes this moment. His right hand, he's holding uh, Gore by the, the left arm. He's holding Bowles there. And as he's speaking, he actually turns occasionally to me, almost, which he almost never, ever did, including me in the conversation. And he's saying, what his conversation is, I just want the two of you to know that, I, that this, I understand how hard it's been recently with all this distraction and everybody's working and we're working on all this stuff and here's all these distractions and all this stuff going on. But I just wanted the two of you to know that I'm telling the truth. So when this event was over and I went and developed these pictures, I made a couple prints, and I took one into to Bowles, who was, had become a friend. He and I would actually we we went uh, would go together to Jimmy Buffett concerts, and, and he knew all the words to all the Jimmy Buffett songs. But I went into Bowles' office with a print of this, and I took it into him, and I said, "You might want to hang on to this. You you might find this picture interesting." But he he stuck with him. Gord, I mean, that was, became kind of the break once it was admitted that he wasn't telling the truth, that he had gone to the extent of lying to their face about the, spinning them like he was spinning a you know, political opponent. Next picture. So this is just one of those funny moments. The Gores, it's a little briefing before an event on the South Lawn. The Gores, which are now no longer a couple. I have no idea why that is. I'm not going to speculate on that. But it's just a. It and this, happens. This, pic, <laughs> this picture ended up in the, uh, in the New York Times. They ran this as a uh, light, life behind the scenes at the White House picture. Next picture. And this is just 
kind of a moment I like. It's just during an event where uh, 41, President Bush and Carter, and they're all sort of there, and it's like one of those moments in the, uh, as you get together with people, nobody quite knows what to say. Just sort of, well, <laughs> what do we do now in the, in the Oval Office? This. Next picture. So this is Gore when he, when he ran. He's still vice president. And this is his vice presidential choice, uh, Senator Lieberman, uh, another fairly same age senator you know, from uh, Connecticut. And it's interesting, because this picture was part of a project. I had left the White House by this time, and I was doing a, a big photo essay on the 18 months on the uh, election of 2000, the election of the millennium. And at one point during that, I was actually photographing the Republican side of the ticket. And I was photographing Karl Rove. And I mentioned to Karl about the choice of Cheney as vice president. And I said, it's fascinating that uh, you guys picked for a vice president somebody who isn't seen as a threat to all the young Republicans who are going to eventually want to run for president. That you're not anointing somebody to, 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 you know, to step ahead which is a little bit what's happening now with, with President Biden, of course. Of course, he couldn't pick anybody older than him, like, like um, <laughs> W did. That'd be pretty hard. But it was interesting that Gore picked Lieberman, which was kind of a, it doesn't, you know, and as Joel was talking, balance. I don't, I, there's not, it's not a real sense of balance there. They're both, uh, you know, there's sort of that conservative Democratic side. And which Lieberman later, of course, became very, very close to John McCain. Senator McCain traveled with him extensively and became a very much outspoken on the more uh, uh, conservative side, Democratic Party. This was on a boat trip, a campaign boat trip, just a, a quick grab. They'd, we were at another end of the boat, and as we ran past, they, they were all just sitting there. Next picture. That's not mine. That's it. <laughs> Okay, Lawrence, if you're not like jet lagged and like yeah. slumped over your computer, <laughs> Lawrence Jackson, he, Lawrence is a former wire service photographer and uh, we're going to get him queued up here. Yeah, oh, there he is. Ooh, wake up. Okay. Got it. So Lawrence is... Father-in-law is a very good friend of mine. He's also a photographer, uh, retired Senator Pat Leahy. And uh, I, I'm guessing Lawrence has probably seen more of his photos than anybody that I would think of because he would show up to a lot of people. Good photographer, great guy. Sorry he's not in the Senate anymore. But Lawrence, uh, uh, tales from the road and tales of the first woman to be vice president of the United States, and he's the guy. So. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, I don't see how I should be the last person to go with these uh, great photographers uh, going before me, but I'm not going to argue. I'm just going to do my job. Um, I'm going to do a little bit different. I'm just going to have the guys, the audio guys, visual guys, switch over to the images. And it's going to be a uh, four, minute, four second image, four second per image loop of, of me talking. So, um, you know, I, um, I started, I picked up uh, Vice President Kamala Harris um, August 13th, 2020, uh, moments before she was announced to be uh, Joe Biden's running, running mate. Uh, for the 2020 presidential election. And um, the campaign was, uh, it wasn't a typical campaign, you know, with the uh, nonstop travel and the stump speeches across battleground, battleground states. Uh, this campaign was during COVID, which was, you know, a whole set of challenges, you know, car Zoom rally, car, car rallies, Zoom rallies, photo lines where people were six feet apart and I was constantly getting tested for COVID. Even today, we get tested uh, whenever we're near the uh, principals for that day. Uh, but since day one of the administration, I've had the honor of front row of watching Vice President Harris and Second Gentleman Imhoff grow and develop into their, their roles of uh, leadership <clears throat> as the first 
female vice president and the first second gentleman of the United States. Um, but it's also been nice to watch the relationship between uh, President Biden and Kamala Harris, Vice President Harris, because, you know, Biden was a former vice president. He saw or he knew what it's like to be a vice president. And I think he's done, you know, as much as he could or can to help her, you know, give, go into the role and figure out, you know, how she can help and how, how she can support him. Um, so the, the thing that I was most drawn into was the first year of the administration, because for, for Vice President Harris and Second General Inhofe, it was, everything was a first for them. You know, it was, uh, you know, I think you've already seen this, the image, but one of my favorite images from this is where uh, the president has his first cabinet meeting with all the members uh, in the room. And if you look at that photo, um, you'll see just a lot of uh, energy, kind of symmetry, uh, and a lot of history in that room because it's the most diverse, diverse cabinet in history. <clears throat> uh, the subsequent years, you know, 2022, 2000, and so far in 2023, uh, have been full of the traditional events, the Easter egg rolls, uh, welcoming sports championship teams to the White House, state dinners, international travel. Uh, but the unexpected events like capturing VP's reaction on board AF2 when the Dobbs decision came down from the Supreme Court. Um, she was, you know, visibly moved, visibly, you know, upset, but also ready to fight. Or when she decided at the last minute to go visit the Tennessee Three in Nashville and gave a powerful speech on hearing the voices of all elected leaders. You know, she decided at the last, I mean, I think we were on Thursday, we were in I want to say like Indianapolis, and then the next day she said, "I want to go to uh, Tennessee and I want to go support those." Uh, that's the photo right there. I want to go support those guys and let them know that their voices are being heard. Um, excuse me. So uh, what I'm looking forward to next uh, is obviously the re-election uh, is forefront but also the many challenges the administration has on economy, the economy, climate change, reproductive rights, voting rights, uh, just to name a few. Uh, one of the last, one of the photos in this carousel is of a young girl watching uh, Vice President Harris as she gets into her motorcade. And uh, you can just look at the girl and you can see the excitement and kind of nervousness that she has on her face. And I gotta tell you, when we're traveling around uh, the country, even the world, uh, so many women and uh, young women are looking up to her uh, for what she represents. And, I, you know, it does not, she accepts that responsibility and she understands that, you know, she takes it very seriously. Uh, so it's not a lot of stories I can tell because I'm actually still in the office uh, doing my job. So... Um, but I would be remiss not to acknowledge uh, Adam Schultz, who was the chief photographer for, for the, uh, uh, this administration, who hired me for the campaign and then you know, helped me get on to, um, the, the administration. And you know, I'll just end it with this. You know, I, I would do this job for free, but my wife and kids won't let me. <laughs> um, but um, I just... I love what I do. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, so I'm going to um, got some questions for my colleagues here. Uh, so I, Bob, uh, took a photo of uh, what was that woman's name? Lewinsky. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And. Um, I think we, I'd like to talk, this would pertain to a vice presidential photographer or presidential photographers, uh, that uh, President Ford once said of me that my tombstone should read, maybe you just want me dead at the moment, that's possible. <laughs> uh, Here lies the worst source in Washington. So let's talk a little bit about um, uh, discretion. 
and why we're there. And, uh, and I think we're all, most photographers, by the way, live for access to get into places no other people get uh, into. And part of our deal, whether we're in the White House or not, is we keep things to ourselves, let the pictures tell the story. So I'm sorry, Dave, just uh, give us a, uh, one situation you were in and then just tell us everything that happened, okay, and <laughs> what was said. <laughs> so give us an idea of what it's like. Well, well, probably one of the biggest things was the beginning of the first Gulf War, and uh, we used to get um, uh, three schedules. Uh, uh, we called it a block schedule, which was showed the month, and there'd be a couple of random trips on there, you know, maybe go to London and, and, and Paris or something. And, and uh, then you'd get a weekly schedule, uh, which was tighter. And then every day, you got a daily schedule, which was literally minute by minute of everything the president would do. But just before the beginning of the first Gulf War, uh, the daily schedule just read private time. So, so there was, uh, you know, he, he was planning uh, uh, the war and, and making phone calls to world leaders and and uh, and so I was going in and photographing those phone calls and and but but you know there was usually cabinet meetings or, or congressional meetings there was always something going on but now it was just all kind of locked into the Oval Office and and uh, uh, Dick Cheney was Secretary of Defense Colin Powell's Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And, and um, uh, one day I got called to the Oval Office and, and uh, I always liked to know before I walked in, especially during that period of time when there was nothing on the schedule, I said, well, you know, what's going on? They said, just go in. And, and I walk in and I realize this is the beginning of the Gulf War. And, and you know, normally we would all go in and, and spend a few minutes and take some photos and maybe work the room a little bit and go Get different angles and and um, and then leave. But this time, um, uh, when I went into the Oval Office and took some photos, the door was locked and I couldn't leave. And I I told my wife beforehand. I said, if I disappear, you know that the war has started. <laughs> and sure enough, I was I was locked in the Oval Office for about 12 hours. And so every so often, I'd go into the private office on the side, uh, you know, just to get away and give myself a break, but give, give them a little bit of space. But whenever there would be a new phone call to a world leader or something, then I'd step back in and, and back and forth. And what was wild, I didn't realize this, there was nobody in the White House that knew what was going on uh, except for that immediate, you know, five or six people. And me, and and so, but I, I think that was a thing where it, it was a matter of trust. And I'll never forget one time he called my office looking for a photo, but he was upset that I wasn't there to take the photo. Meanwhile, I had had a print made, and I walked up and I said, you know, he was saying, well, I, I thought you were going to be here, and I handed him the print, and and to me that was like the biggest compliment because. I was with him, and he wasn't aware that I was there. And, and I think that's how we all uh, work best, is, is being there, but not being there. Bob. Well, one of the things is David was talking, there are events that, like, at the time, there's a lot of interest on the outside that really wants to know something's going on or whatever's going on or they don't even know. There's a funny little echo. Oh. That was me. That's you, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> the, uh, but one of the parts of the job, obviously, or any kind of job, in return for the access, there is a certain discretion, but there's also the resp historical responsibility that those images are made and that they will be eventually part of the history of that time. Now, who gets to decide that? I mean, obviously, we're still, I think I just read recently, there's some struggle over the some Kennedy assassination material that was supposed to be released that hasn't been in whether or not it will be. 
But this idea, you know, that this stuff will never ever come out or never be released is a, um, it, it sort of flies in the face of, of whatever the transparency might be of the historical record. But who gets to decide? Like right there, I mean, they locked the door. Dan, nobody's going to get out and hear about it. But of course, that's an on, about to be an ongoing war, and the, and the intelligence is incredibly valuable. The the pictures, uh, one of the one, what David is talking about uh, during the government shutdown in '95, when the um, relationship with the president and Monica started. At one point, we're there late at night. The government's still shut down. They're trying to get votes. And we're at a very skeleton staff in the uh, White House because of the way the, with the government shut down, there can only be certain level people there. There can only be the, the top, like I, as, as the director of the photo office, I was there all the time. I was the only photographer. Nobody that worked for me could be there. And the help that at that point were unpaid and they were interns. And one of them was this young woman uh, from California. And at one point, out of the blue, I, and I had no idea what was going on, as did uh, uh, a lot of people, including the chief of staff. Um, the president walks over to this young intern, puts his arm around, says, or sort of, actually didn't put his arm around her. He sort of put his hand, I, I'm not quite sure. The picture's been published because Ken Starr subpoenaed it. But he said, now, Bob, take a picture of me and this intern. I'm like, OK, sure. You know, intern's in here working and everything. And I took it. but. I put that picture in the, my uh, restricted file so nobody could get it. And I got, for a long time, I got, kept getting these phone calls from my picture editor saying, this young woman keeps coming up and said, you took a picture of her and the president. And she, she said, he said she could have it. I said, nope, she can't have it. No, we're not going to let And eventually, it did get out. She doesn't still have a copy. and, and um, But Ken, you know, Ken Starr subpoenaed it and put it in. And um, the only other person who I ever never let have a picture, obviously you do a lot of ceremonial pictures, but you do have a lot of control as a White House photographer, was Dick Morris, who had been this presidential advisor who sort of fell on his sword at one point, fell on something. Um, <laughs> and um, he had all, he would be in there, I mean, he was in meetings. But he, and he would be over in my, and they'd say, no, those are restricted files. You can't have them. Well, finally, he did publish a book. And the only picture he was able to get and find of him and the president had been in a handshake line at Christmas, taken by one of the other photographers. I hadn't taken it. And so I didn't, couldn't control it. And he'd managed to find it. But of course, he's turning up again now with our uh, last president. He's sort of an advisor to uh, the last president who's running again. You're kind of a vengeful guy, Bob. <laughs> oh, you're, you're talking, Dan. <laughs> so, Lawrence, uh, the thing about being the vice president's photographer, like when we, I mean, in, in the case of both of them, graduated to be the chief photographer, then there are other photographers working for you. Uh, Lawrence is like, if I correct, you're a one-man band. And um, so... Tell us about your day. I mean, so that always interested me. I mean, I think you're probably working way harder than most other people in government, would be my guess. <laughs> but tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's not, it's not that bad. I mean, or at least I'm used to it, so I can't really complain. Um, I am the only photographer for the vice president. Um, she's great. Uh, she trusts me, and I make the world of her. But a typical day is usually gets in around 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Um, she has her schedule till about 6, 37, usually. Um, she doesn't have a lot of uh, external meetings most, most days. It's more internal stuff. But then when she hits the road, which she hits the road quite a bit, uh, that's when I'm probably the busiest. Like this month in September, we're gonna hit the road five or six or maybe seven dates for uh, we're doing a college tour visit where she's going to speak to young college students about registering uh, to vote. Uh, there's some study done where, you know, you can't go to the, these kids, you know, a month before the actual day, you know, or the, the actual voting day. You need to start with them early and hit them often about the importance of voting. 
so when she hits the road, you know, our days are pretty long and, um, you know, my, my kids are, our kids are 19 and 17, so they don't really miss me that much. <laughs> but, yeah, so it's, it's a lot of work, but I'm not complaining. I, I, I just got a, a, well, not just, but I got a, a photo editor last July. So for the first year and a half of the job, it was really just me. It was me doing the picture taking, the editing, the scan, or all this stuff, the, and getting the pictures out. So, but the last year and a half, or the last year and a couple of months, I've had a, a photo editor, which made my life a lot easier. I don't think I envy you. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm older now and getting tired of this stuff. Uh, let's talk about VP archives a little bit. Uh, the President's Archive, the, it's all part of the National Archive system. Uh, that's the Ford Library. All the presidential libraries are part of the National Archive system. But the VP pictures are different. Now, in my case, when I was the White House photographer, I assigned somebody out of my office to, uh, uh, I'm going to tell a, the Ricardo story. I don't know why, so <laughs> you, you need to hear this. Anyway, uh, uh, so I would assign somebody to Nelson Rockefeller, and I had a really great photographer from uh, um, Detroit I hired, and the first African-American photographer to work in the White House. That wasn't why I hired him. I loved his pictures, and he came in, and I thought, I'm going to give him the best opportunity of his life sign him to Nelson Rockefeller. And uh, I don't know where his career is going to go after this, but one thing about Rockefeller, uh, he tended to keep people on after whatever he was doing. And <clears throat> But uh, Ricardo wanted to be me, and Nelson Rockefeller didn't want me. Uh, he didn't want somebody like me who was like, pounding it out all the time, like what the rest of us have done. And uh, uh, I got a phone call in my office from Nelson Rockefeller, and he said, hey, Dave, uh, and he had this growly voice. He said, listen, uh, I got a problem. He said, this guy, Ricardo, he said, he just won't leave the office when I tell him to leave. <laughs> and, and this is like not a good thing, right? And I said, well, let me talk to him. He says, no, I, I want to replace him. And so... I ended up having to replace Ricardo, who then went back on the White House rotation. And I told Rick, and I, I said, I, I appreciate what you do, but I was on his side. And, um, but Nelson Rockefeller was a really private guy, and when he looked at somebody and told him to leave the office, <laughs> he was used to them leaving, and Ricardo wouldn't leave. And uh, I loved Ricardo for doing that, by the way, and, and Ricardo, uh, um, did just fine after that. But th this is kind of the thing, like, um, in my case, I don't, President Ford, I don't think ever gave me uh, the look, you know, but we've all experienced it in our career where, um, but usually we anticipate, this is, I've got everything I need, it's a good time, <clears throat> excuse me, to walk out. Would you say that's a fair way of putting it? But, uh, uh, so our job is a lot of instinct. And, and um, I did replace Ricardo with a, a guy who left when he was told to leave, by the way. <laughs> and he went to work for uh, Rockefeller afterwards, and probably made a lot of money. Anyway, uh, David, uh, I want you to tell me about, um, oh, the archive. I'm sorry, one thing about the VP archive. Where is your uh, Bush? VP archives. So we were actually just having this conversation. Uh, Vice President Bush's photos, the photos I took, because I was like Lawrence, a one-man band, uh, are today at the uh, Bush Presidential Library, College Station, Texas. So are Vice President Quayle's photos. So I think it's the only There are only two archives, of those, though, right? that have two VP archives together uh, at a presidential library. And what, what well, about Mondale's well, well, Lawrence, stuff? Lawrence, you keep all your stuff as a separate 
VP file, it's all kept separate completely? It's, uh, so we have a numbering system now for our digital images. Everything for the president starts with the P and everything for the vice president starts with the V. Right, do you shoot uh, alongside Adam when the two of them are together on some events? And stuff yep. so that but so it's separated that way though anything you shoot that has both of them is is just still goes in the vice presidential correct right it wouldn't go in the presidential got it because i yeah because i was remembering when i first went in with mondale and carter was a little bit like uh nelson rockefeller and a little bit like nixon you know he was uh you know, you've got enough pictures. And um, occasionally, the guys who had, were there to photograph Carter didn't want to do it anymore. I think they got tired of being waved out or told not to take anymore. And I would go in occasionally and, and make those pictures. And if I was just shooting anything I shot with Carter and it went to the Carter file, even yeah. if it, even uh, pretty much anything like if it was a big event and even if Mondale was there. But I, I wouldn't actually ever go in on my own, if, if it was Mondale and Carter, it would be one of the presidential guys that would go in. I, did, I didn't go in you know, at the same time with them. So okay. it, it'll, it'll be interesting to see if Vice, President's, Vice President Biden's photos go to Barack Obama's library, or if Vice President Biden's photos go to the Biden presidential library. We'll, we'll call him up and Biden. ask him. Actually, right there. Lawrence can find out. You know, go ask. All right? <laughs> go ask the president. L L Lawrence, <laughs> Lawrence, have you ever yeah. heard that? <laughs> that's it. No, that's all cool. Get back to us on that. <laughs> all right, I'm going to, one other thing. Like, we've all had, uh, very, like, David had a great picture of uh, VP Bush with, uh, the grandkids and everything in, in the bed there. That, that's a classic picture. Um, let's talk a little bit about family because with the, with the, in my case, uh, I had upstairs, downstairs access with uh, uh, the Fords. And it, it doesn't always work that way. I mean, there's some, like, it, I don't have specific examples, but with, well, as far as, the second gentleman and all that. Does he? Do you handle his photos too? By the way, well, uh, Lawrence, Lawrence, like, do you handle the second gentleman's photographs? Or uh, well, he has. So for our system uh, in this administration, every principal—the first lady, second gentleman, vice president, president—they all have their own filing system. So it's uh, for the first lady. It's the letter F. President P, Vice President B, and Second Gentleman is S. Um, he does the vice. The Second Gentleman does not have a, a, a full-time photographer, but we have a staff of four or five photographers. So whenever he does something that needs coverage, when it, somebody will come and cover his uh, his events. Right, and with Bob, with uh, <clears throat> the First Ladies generally run the. Second floor of the White House. So how did that work with you? Right. Well, to go back to the VP part of it, there wasn't an awful, I mean, I had a very good working relationship with Joan Mondale and photographed her and the kids and a lot when we traveled. Didn't, the problem, of course, with the vice president, it's not as accessible in the same way that the White House is. I mean, it's a separate residence up on Massachusetts Avenue, so you're not there just to walk upstairs and make pictures. In, in, and I, they live there, right? They live on, on the, yeah, the observatory. So you're not making the same kind of thing. But now in the White House, no. And the, the rule there between uh, Mrs. Clinton and the fact that they had a teenage daughter, I mean, there was a real sort of sense, the, the privacy. I, I mean, I would go up with him, follow him up for meetings and stuff in the Yellow Oval. Or if there was something going on, I would follow him up and every now and then have some kind of moment where maybe running into the first lady in her bathrobe, which was not a good deal. You know, you'd want to turn around. I, I know we're about out of time. Any questions out here for yeah, anybody? You... Whipple, come on, man, you're a reporter. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta come up with something here. Leaves, <laughs> right. you got anything uh, you want to burning? Not a question. We got a question over here. Okay. 
I wonder if you could talk about the, uh, how technology has changed. I assume that Lawrence is probably shooting digital uh, photography, and I assume the other three gentlemen are probably old enough to be using actual film, uh, color film. But um, no. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> what, what, how does that? I, I shot. I shot everything with a black hood over my head, and, and <laughs> he was a like Matthew Brady. Guy. Matthew Brady is my inspiration. So, so the question. I guess my question is. Does that impact the way in which you interact or do your pho photography? And any thoughts on how that impacts uh, what future archives are going to look like? Well, the, the changeover to digital really happened with Draper and uh, George W. Bush. And he started out with film and integrated it over. But now we're all, I mean, everybody's shooting digital now. And uh, I'm assuming. You have, what, like two or three backups of everything, like uh, Lawrence with your... Yeah. Is that right? I mean, so the, the, there's always going to be a question, like how long is that stuff going to last? I mean, this is, we don't know, really. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I've heard the conversation about the digital files, and, and uh, I, I started with digital photography after I left the White House and went to head up photography for the Walt Disney Company. And, and the conversation was always, I mean, we started with floppy disk, and we, we did SciQuest, and then, then we did CDs. And it, and it keeps changing. And it'll be interesting 40, 50, 60, 100 years from now what that technology is going to be. And you keep kind of transferring that stuff over the film. Um, uh, I, I know my film at the Bush Library in College Station is in a, in a cold storage, uh, and, and whenever somebody needs something, they scan it with today's technology. Well, I think uh, it, we'll wrap it up so Gleaves can uh, make his announcement. Is this where you pass the, uh, the, the money thing around? <laughs> <laughs> like church. Um, Digital photography hasn't really changed the way we see things. I mean, I think that was one of the, for me, I made the transition in early 2000, and now it's all digital shooting uh, cannons in my case, but uh, there's a lot of great gear out there. But it, ha it doesn't change anything in the way I see it. Just the technology is different. Uh, it doesn't affect how I feel about things or the way I'm looking at them. Leave. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, that was just great. Thank you all uh, and our Zoom visitors, everybody who got to watch this. What an enlightening evening. And I'm so glad that we've been privileged. I'm Gleaves Whitney. I'm the executive director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. I mentioned that over on the foundation side because we've been so privileged to work with our great partners on the library and museum side, led by Brooke Clement, and uh, the wonderful exhibit, which is open tonight uh, on the vice presidency, you should see, uh, curated by Morel Lukey here in the front row. I think they did a great job. Everybody did a great job. You know, and I've got to say as a story, and you know, so much of the history we know as Americans, it's like driving down the interstate. We have general impressions. The photographers, all four of you, you take us on the back roads, uh, the byways. I mean, really, it's just wonderful to get this granular Off view of what's going on. Off the cliff sometimes. What's that? <laughs> Off the cliff. <laughs> Off the cliff. <laughs> uh, but all of you survived. And I just think it's, it's wonderful. There are some people in the audience I just want to point out. I've already mentioned the, my colleagues over in the, uh, the museum, for whom I'm very appreciative. But we also have Ford family members. Let's not leave them out of the story. Bob and Karen Ford, thanks so much for being here tonight. <laughs> and of course, we have you, the friends of Ford, whom we always appreciate and know David Kennerly, I'm not going to be passing around the hat for, for money. <laughs> uh, you know, this is sort of halftime. We've had a wonderful start to this conference. Tomorrow it's going to resume starting at 9.30. We're going to have two panels. We're going to have Richard Norton Smith, who's also going to be our keynoter tomorrow. It's going to be a wonderful day. So come back tomorrow. But to refuel you tonight 
for tomorrow. I think you need a sugar high, right? So let's go out into the lobby and we'll have a dessert reception. And remember, the exhibit, that marvelous exhibit on the vice presidency is open tonight. So avail yourselves of that as well. Thank you so much. Good night.